I'm Barbara Everett Bryant, a member of the Heritage Committee of the American Association of Public Opinion Research. And today I'm interviewing Professor Michael uh, Trauga, who's been very active in APOR, as we call it. Uh, Michael is currently a professor of communication and political science at the University of Michigan and senior research scientist at the Institute for Social Research. Mike, and that's the only way we in A4 know you, uh, and that's how I'll address you from now on, even though you are uh, Dr. Michael Trowgood with a uh, PhD in political uh, science from the University of Michigan. And you went undergraduate to uh, Princeton uh, University and stuck with political science all the way through, I think. So uh, when and how did you get into research and most specifically public opinion research? Well, it was a series of uh, fortuitous, almost accidental events, for which, of course, I'm, I'm very grateful, that started in my uh, undergraduate career. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Princeton. I started out as an engineer. I was not very successful. And about my third semester, I, I needed to find something else to do. And I uh, was interested in engineering originally because I had strong empirical interest and was comfortable with computers. This is in the early 1960s. And there was a movement beginning in political science, uh, quantitative uh, studies, political behavior. And I was also earning part of uh, my way at college. And I saw on a bulletin board one day uh, an ad for an uh, interview, interviewing position at the Gallup organization. So it was, uh, first of all, a congruence of uh, these coincidences at Princeton that turned me to political science. I had a great mentor at uh, Princeton, Stanley Kelly. And uh, I started out interviewing, and uh, then I became a research assistant for Dr. Gallup in the summer between my junior and senior years, 1964. They were uh, running up to a presidential election. I stayed in Princeton and uh, worked at the Gallup organization. And uh, I think right up until the fall, I, I thought probably, like a lot of my classmates, I was going to go to law school. And then uh, both uh, Stan Kelly and uh, Dr. Gallup uh, thought I ought to go to the University of Michigan to graduate school. And I ought to learn more about uh, survey research at the Survey Research Center. So I, I was able to do that. And uh, I, I, again, needed some way to. Uh, you know, pay for my tuition and other expenses. So I, I got a job at uh, what was the Survey Research Center then. I did various uh, activities. And then in 1968, I started to work with Warren Miller uh, on a project uh, through which we were providing consultation to ABC television for their um, election coverage. And this uh, was, again, in the uh, context of a presidential election. Uh, Warren and I would fly to New York on uh, Tuesdays or, or Monday nights to uh, participate in primary coverage in the spring and then to do general election coverage. And we did this through the 1970s, maybe through 1976. And unbeknownst to me, uh, I became a kind of a participant observer in a period when television, network television, was capturing election coverage from newspapers. And the coverage of elections was converting from essentially print to electronic. And it coincided with the time at which the uh, networks were starting to develop their own polling units. And polling was becoming uh, uh, an important part of uh, journalistic coverage of current events as well as elections. and. This stimulated my interest, which was originally in elections and voting, and then uh, also somewhat survey methodology, into uh, one of the enduring themes, I guess, of my own research program, which is the use of polls and the creation of news, the quality of data used in uh, polling, and how uh, citizens come to understand polls and develop an interest in public opinion.
So you've been uh, combining this uh, sort of a journalistic interest and a survey research interest really ever since uh, your undergraduate days. Yes, I have. Um, I, I, I know um, George and uh, Alec Gallup uh, from, you know, this time, going back to this time in Princeton. I was talking to Alec at the last APOR meeting uh, about how the uh, press releases, in, in those days there was an American Institute for Public Opinion Research, IPO, that produced uh, bi-weekly press releases out of a Gallup poll. And they actually worked with a printer whose shop was across the street from the building where the Gallup organization was. And they used to actually run back and forth across the street with uh, galleys that were edited with, uh, you know, pr sort of printer's uh, editorial marks and have it read typeset and so on. And the concept now of delivering uh, information the way the Gallup organization does uh, on a website where they, you get an automatic email saying that today is uh, Tuesday, your briefing is ready for you, and it contains embedded video, of course, is a, is a very different world. Uh, did you grow up in the East? Um, how did you get to Princeton? Just well, that, tracking a little bit. Sure. Uh, this was another kind of uh, interesting accidental and fortuitous event. I, I did grow up in the East, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, and um, neither of my parents uh, attended college. My father was an immigrant from uh, Germany. He probably would have gone to college. And uh, my mother was a uh, first generation American of Italian descent. So I was the oldest child of three. My parents uh, valued education very highly. Uh, I went to an independent school in Providence, Moses Brown School. I was a pretty good student. And uh, when it came time to think about college, of course, my parents had no idea about college except Brown University was in Providence. It's a good school. Uh, but my headmaster was a Princeton graduate. And uh, the headmaster said that I ought to think about going to Princeton. And in the context of this engineering program that I was interested in, because I was, had been a good science student, they had a very interesting opportunity there, a kind of a general engineering program, basic engineering. And th that's how that decision came about. Well, and uh, it led you in the right direction, I guess. Uh, if you look back over your career, which now extends from approximately 64 to uh, 2005, and we are interviewing you on January 7, uh, 2005, uh, what do you think your most contribu important contributions have been to research so far, and I say so far because I think you still have. I don't think I'm done. <laughs> quite a career yet ahead. Well, they fall in a in a number of uh, uh, areas. Um, I've always been interested in methodological issues at the interface of um, academic applications and commercial applications. So I have written about. Uh, with Clyde Tucker, for example, about the likely voter selection process. I've, I've written about uh, standard procedures uh, for conducting commercial uh, survey uh, research, commercial polls, for example, the impact of the number of callbacks on the kinds of measurements you get in political variables. So I, I have a, a, a bunch of uh, research that falls into that particular vein. Um, I also am very interested in what people understand about polling and uh, how low their levels of knowledge are and how uh, this affects their ability to interpret and understand polls. I'm also interested in what journalists know about polls and how they write about them and the problems that uh, polling presents to them. And <clears throat> I have um, returned recently to uh, a theme that actually goes back to my uh, dissertation and even to my undergraduate work about election administration and especially post-2000, um, uh, how citizens are interacting with the new technology of voting 
and uh, what they make of this not only as a technology but how it affects their sense of the um, integrity of the American electoral system. I, I have a project in the back of my mind, uh, talking prospectively, uh, in which I'd like to bring together some of my work about how uh, people understand what other people think and form their judgments about their own views based upon not only the uh, resources that they have internally, but their interpretation of what's going on in the world around them and what other people think. What would you say are the major changes in survey research from the time you've been involved in it? Well, one thing that's changed a great deal, which is true of virtually every form of uh, contemporary life and also uh, contemporary research, is the impact of technology. When, when uh, I worked at the Gallup organization as a, you know, as this research assistant, they were doing surveys with face-to-face -face interviews in which they mailed out all the interviews into the field, and then they had to wait until they came back. And <clears throat> as I was, and when I got to Michigan, the, they were still doing almost all of their work with face-to-face -face interviews as well. So within, I would say, the first uh, 10 years of my uh, work uh, starting in graduate school, um, there was a conversion to telephone interviews. And this was going to be a great uh, savior of uh, the data collection activity. It probably was on the commercial side because of the cost reductions. Uh, and then we began to develop, I mean the field began to develop research programs on things like mode effects and to evaluate uh, the strengths and weaknesses of each method and to think about areas in which they were appropriate. And then, of course, the, 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 there were associated uh, technological shifts that came with the use of low-cost computing, personal computers. You probably started out with punch cards, didn't you? I spent my time, as uh, many of us did who were graduate students, lugging boxes back and forth to counter sorters. That's right. Uh, this was work that you... Uh, the, the, the rhythm of graduate students has changed a little bit, but not too much, uh, but probably for different reasons. But when I was a graduate student, we worked at night because the pressure on this uh, kind of equipment was reduced. And so you could, uh, you could get your work done more efficiently and rapidly by, by, by working at night. Um, so with the advent of personal computers, th then we went to things like uh, caddy systems. And this was, uh, I think, really a striking innovation because not only did it provide better data, uh, reduced human error at various points in the process, but it also permitted more sophisticated um, designs, taking advantage of the you know, uh, branching opportunities of the, of the CADI software. Um, that's been extended to now the use of things like uh, computer-aided personal interviews where interview interviewers take laptops around. I, I've been involved in a project looking at the impact of television advertising in which we went to people's homes with uh, laptops. We had a protocol on the laptop, but we also had embe embedded pieces of video. And we could turn the, the laptop around and show it to the respondent, and they could be randomly assigned to one of a number of uh, video treatments. And now, of course, there's the web and the, and the use of uh, web-based surveys. And um, what's, what's going on now is um, beyond what we think of as the normal interviewing process, the um, wide range of opportunities for stimulus materials to be added to an interview. It's, we're, we're way beyond the period where we had this thing called a show card where you could hand the respondent either a, a scale to prompt them or remind them of what the scale was, or you could hand them uh, some illustration uh, or, or, or some diagram. And now we can use a video that can be manipulated in a true experimental way. We can change audio, change the soundtrack, uh, the, the sort of conveyed message. So this has really been, uh, when you think back across this period, quite a startling set of changes. In a relatively short period of time, 
as we would say, no interviewer within our lifetime. Uh, showing the liquor scale on a cardboard ruler. You know. Right. Uh, are there restraints you have uh, faced in, in, in research? Of course, money is always a restraint, but I mean uh, other uh, kinds of uh, restraints on what you could or couldn't ask or do. No, I've never had that. I've, uh, I mean, I. I've never had any restraints of a, uh, you know, sort of any, any concern about, you know, confidentiality, legality, appropriateness, anything like that. In in the kind of work that I do, um, you you have to plan ahead in order to be able to field studies appropriately uh, in uh, conjunction with the electoral cycle. So uh, if you're writing proposals to seek external funding to field a study, uh, you have to get the sequencing right, otherwise you miss the election. And uh, I've had this problem occur to me, you know, once or twice. Um, but you, you know, learn how to deal with this and, and you know, do better the next time. But that's the only, that's the only serious constraint or restraint. So now in early 2005, you're thinking 2008. Yes. Um, well, let's turn a minute to uh, APOR. Uh, what was your first APOR conference? Well, uh, let, let me say something by way of uh, background. When, when I got to uh, Ann Arbor uh, in, in the fall of 1965, um, and then, you know, started my graduate career. W one of the things that really impressed me uh, about uh, the sagacity of, you know, Stan Kelly and uh, George Gallup sending me to Ann Arbor um, was the great set of colleagues that I had, uh, people who were active researchers and also on the forefront of both public opinion and uh, research and political behavior. And, and beyond the people that I met at the University of Michigan, uh, Angus Campbell, Warren Miller, Don Stokes, uh, Phil Converse. Um, I also ha had the chance to meet uh, people who were very active in the commercial sector as well, people that you know, Fred Courier and uh, Bob Teeter. And um, <clears throat> I, as a graduate student, I was completely oblivious to the fact that um, there had been this kind of distancing between the uh, commercial market researchers and the academics, uh, which was, I guess, a residual of uh, 1948 uh, and the Mosteller report. You know, and it hadn't been less than 20, it had been almost 20 years, but still the, the, there hadn't been any rapprochement. But there was a group of people uh, who, at, at Michigan, who actually started, thought about trying to do something about this. So I didn't even know what the American Association for Public Opinion Research was uh, when I got to Ann Arbor, and it didn't really register uh, with me for um, the first several years. But in uh, the early 1970s, it got onto my radar. And I can't remember whether my first meeting was in 1974 or 1976, uh, but it would have been in one of those two years. Uh, I never attended one of these uh, legendary meetings in New York, but I do remember very clearly going to Buck Hill Falls and the inn at Buck Hill Falls in the Poconos. And so um, it was a perfect organization for me in a way because my work had always straddled uh, sometimes inadvertently, but my work had always straddled the commercial and the academic parts of uh, survey research. And this was an organization that brought together uh, people who um, came from those two camps as well as people from the government, government researchers and survey research. So uh, I found it a very um, in inviting and comfortable organization. And uh, when uh, they asked for people to help out with various activities, you know, I was, I was happy to do that. Uh, what do you feel have been your own contributions to APOR? You talk about having uh, 
helped out with various things, and I know you rose to be president of the organization. So. Well, um, I think that my <coughs> contributions probably center around uh, some set of bridging activities between the commercial and the academic sectors. Um, there's been for a long time uh, uh, a kind of a tension in APOR about uh, standards of disclosure. Sometimes it was fixated on the issue of uh, response rates uh, and whether response rates should be reported. Um, and I think that I contributed somewhat to um, a, a greater emphasis on the need for disclosure in order to maintain uh, the integrity of the discipline and the profession and uh, to foster a greater public comfort and ease with the, with the idea of polling. Um, as you as you know, we're, we're, we've been through and, and and remain in a relatively difficult period. Um, not not a disastrous period, but a period of tension because of um, a, a variety of public incidents, events, in conjunction with uh, a changing style of news coverage. Of politics. This is the way that I would describe it. Um, <clears throat> they have to do with claims about the accuracy of pre-election polls or bias in them. Uh, in the last three cycles, uh, counting the off-year election, they have to do with commentary about the exit polls. Uh, and even as we speak, we're still in the middle of one of these controversies about 2004. And the, these events have taken place in a period in which uh, the coverage of political news has changed, and especially in cable venues, we have this kind of conflictual adversarial uh, format in which you pick somebody from the right and somebody from the left, or somebody who's pro-polling and someone who's anti-polling, and you have a moderator who kind of stirs them up. And um, so one of my current research projects actually deals with commentary about polls and pollsters across the last, uh, you know, the last few cycles and about what, you know, what the public thinks about polls. So this is a set of issues that I, I know that the current council uh, and the current uh, president, Nancy Belden, is, is very interested in the image of polling and pollsters. And it's something that requires a good deal of care and feeding. There's some suggestion in the work that was done for the uh, last APOR conference uh, that the polling industry has thrived because of its symbiotic relationship with uh, news organizations. If you if you go back to the start of the Gallup poll in 1936, uh, you know Dr. Gallup Dr. Gallup's interest wasn't really to uh, be uh, uh, the public voice or face of the public. He wanted to find a way to stimulate his co commercial business. He was a strong believer in, in democracy and democratic theory, but he wanted to find a public face, a way to uh, stimulate his commercial business in this new field. So <clears throat> he struck up this relationship with the Washington Post in which he told them he could do a better job than the Literary Digest or they could have their money back. Um, and the the commercial pollsters, uh, uh, Elmo Roper and Arch Crosley, as well as Dr. Gallup, thrived because of the ability to disseminate their name and their findings through through the public media. Nowadays, there's a suggestion that as the uh, public confidence and trust in the media has declined the linkage between polls and pollsters and news organizations may be affecting us negatively. And uh, this would be a very interesting but strange turn of events given the history of, of the development of the relationship between the two. But um, this is, this is uh, very interesting and very troubling. And, and going back to your question about technology, one 
One implication of more advanced technology is that it's become easier and cheaper for um, individuals and very small organizations to get into the business and to offer, uh, to do uh, work, if you want to call it that, at very low cost. Um, and so the technology and the quality of the work uh, that's produced every now and then, uh, but gets a great deal of media attention, is also of uh, some concern as well. Looking ahead, do you feel that you've been through the best of times on interviewing when we got to the caddy systems and 95% of households having a fixed line a telephone so that it was easier to access? And now we see you know, the rise of cell phones and uh, we're going to see an increasing number of households that never bother with a fixed line and a lot more resistance just because of the increase in the number of polling organizations, a lot more resistance to responding? Well, this is a, uh, actually a very complicated, very interesting and very complicated uh, uh, set of issues. Um, I think in general the advent of telephone interviewing has been very good because we, we wouldn't be doing the uh, kind of work, the quality of work, the number of studies that we as a profession are doing now if it weren't for the reduced costs that come from telephone interviewing. So <clears throat> there's no question at all that this has uh, been a kind of a blessing. Um, but the thing that, one of the things that's always fascinated me about the field is not the, is the way that substantive results can be affected by the methodological issues of data collection and research design. And um, the move towards telephone interviewing has refocused people, I think, on issues of question wording and question context, uh, not only taking the limitations of the phone into account, but also there's been a process by which the speed of data collection has increased. People think it's easier to get to the field. Um, news organizations certainly think that they can get uh, uh, surveys to the field much more rapidly on issues that they think by their newsworthy criteria uh, are uh, pressing topics of the day. And sometimes <clears throat> the quality of the question wording is, uh, uh, or, or, or the question structure or the response categories uh, leaves something to be desired. So um, we're seeing more cases or instances in which um, there are puzzles, apparent puzzles of uh, public opinion uh, that can be resolved or uh, at least analyzed in the context of differences in, in question wording and style and uh, format. Um, so it's actually increased the research possibilities, the interesting research questions that can be uh, addressed. What do you see as the future of web, uh, web or internet uh, interviewing? I think many of us have had a lot of concerns about response rates by now. Well, there, there uh, I, I'd be much more concerned about the web than I would about uh, <clears throat> cell phone use. I mean, um, on the cell phone side, just let me say quickly that I don't really know what the prospects are of the United States catching up with Europe in terms of cell phone use patterns because we have this radically different charging algorithm, charging structure where the, um, call, where the receiver has to pay for the call in addition to the caller having to pay for the call. So we're missing out on a lot of interesting opportunities there that people in Europe are uh, engaged in. I mean, we, we, have, we still have the concept of uh, a household interview because that's what the landline is attached to. <clears throat> so to find more respondents, you have to, to find most respondents, you have to call their household first and then do some kind of selection process. So we, we lose... Uh, 
the ability to conduct studies of people based upon where they are. And they're doing a lot of interesting work in this regard in uh, other countries, in Europe, for example. So you, have a, you can have a time, time of day, day of the week sample. Call people, they pick up a cell phone, you can ask them about what it is they're doing. And <clears throat> what, um, other questions that are related to that. On the web side, um, I think the progress is going to be slower, but we're moving uh, inevitably, inexorably, towards uh, uh, much wider use of web-based surveys. There is this question of penetration. It costs more, first of all, to get at a computer, uh, it, uh, especially to buy one, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and then to get a uh, good service, you have to probably you know, pay for a broadband connection as opposed to a dial-up mode and so on. Uh, but the potential is just unbelievable compared to the telephone because of the use of these uh, other stimuli like uh, uh, text or, or uh, video or audio. And uh, the, 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 uh, the range and the number of research opportunities is just unbelievable there. I, 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 can, uh, I can hardly wait for this to, to, um, to progress. Which makes the future look uh, uh, very bright. Well, could, looking again for just a few moments in the past as we close out this interview, uh, how has ACOR itself changed in the time uh, you've been a member? I'm talking about the organization rather than the technology of interviewing. Well, uh, let me let me make a couple of superficial comments first, and then I'll talk about you know kind of deeper changes. When I went to um, these first meetings, you know, in the '70s in the uh, on the East Coast, um, the the quality of the uh, papers presentations was uh, I think just as good, but the social activities were organized differently. And the banquet on Saturday night was a <clears throat> much more extravagant affair. My, my impression of APOR at the time, which could be false, remember that these are through the lenses of a graduate student, but my impression of APOR at the time uh, was that um, this was an organization essentially of the commercial sector with some academics there. And it was kind of organized on commercial uh, uh, expense account kind of arrangement. So on Saturday dinner, it was much more lavish. And I remember very distinctly that men wore tuxedos and uh, women uh, dressed up <coughs> in a similar fashion. So uh, over time, of course, it's become much less formal. Uh, and it's become a much larger organization. And it's become a more diverse organization. Uh, I've been a program chair, and I've talked to other program chairs at uh, APOR, and uh, they, uh, yeah, that's that. Yeah. Well, you were president of APOR in 99-2000, and do you have some particular memories or feel there were some you know, significant activities that you undertook during your presidency? Well, <clears throat> I, I think that um, we worked uh, a great deal. First of all, on, uh, in the APOR Council, there's a, a great deal of continuity from council to council. And a uh, one-year term of a president um, doesn't really provide for an opportunity for, you know, radical change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there had been some work on uh, the development of these uh, completion codes for interviews. <clears throat> which was a one way to work up to the issue of uh, response rates, response rate calculation. Can we start again? <coughs> Do you feel there were any significant activities that you undertook during that year or that are hallmarks of your time as president? And leading up to that, of course, you would have been on the council. Well, <clears throat> for uh, any individual who is uh, vice president and uh, you know, pre president-elect and then president, the amount of time 
that you serve in these offices is quite limited and it's virtually impossible for there to be any kind of you know, radical change in such a short period of time. And in the normal APOR mechanism, there's a great deal of continuity from uh, council to council. But I was president during a period in which um, there was a group that had been working for some time on uh, what we call completion codes, which were the basic elements that could be used to define response rates. And so um, during the time when I was president, uh, standards for disclosure were uh, an, an important uh, issue. I wasn't actually president during the presidential campaign. I was past president, that is in the fall of 2000. But we also uh, initiated this committee of three, uh, which is the uh, president-elect, the president, and the past president, to try to provide more rapid response to issues that came up with regard to the use of polls, uh, especially in the context of coverage of political campaigns. And that uh, system was used again in uh, the 2004 campaign, I think, uh, pretty effectively. Um, the, my, my time was just at the beginning of this concern about the image of uh, the industry and of individuals. That work has really been uh, done by people who um, succeeded me. I, um, I was concerned, uh, as I had been in my previous work, about the relationship between APOR and journalists and the coverage of public opinion. Uh, one thing that presidents get to do is, in the, in the preparation of their presidential address, to talk about things that are of special interest to them. So this was a focus of my presidential address uh, that I gave in uh, Portland. Um, and this, I think, is going to be a continuing and important uh, interest of the organization and of subsequent uh, presidents. What we really need, which I think is not within the capabilities of APOR itself, what we really need is a, uh, a consultancy for journalists. Uh, a way that journalists can contact skilled public opinion researchers for advice without worrying actually about whether they have to pay for it or how much they have to pay for it, uh, just to know that there's a, ha a handy, knowledgeable uh, uh, reference person. Um, because the most important thing that I think we can do is to keep bad data out of the news stream. Uh, when data enter the news stream, they become the equivalent of facts simply by their existence in the news stream. So that our, our primary task is to get data out. I, I used to keep data out. I used to think that if we could provide better training to journalists, this would help. But um, there is no long-term future for a journalist in being a public opinion specialist. There are one or two or three of these who do their jobs quite well, but it's not a, a, a clear career path in the profession. So we, we essentially have a lot of transitory individuals, mostly in the context of elections, uh, who are covering polling. And they don't have any training or background. They don't know how to do critical evaluations. It ought to be our job to help them. Um, the problem for APOR is, of course, that you can't have, uh, or we, we haven't figured out a way that you can have uh, an APOR certified consultant an APOR approved polling organization, uh, an APOR approved poll. And so we have to find a, a kind of a parallel mechanism or an independent mechanism to provide this kind of service. And, and this is one of the projects, one of my interests and one of the projects I'd like to continue uh, working on during the remainder of my career. Well, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Good to see you, you again, so too. Thank you.